Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode. I always say it every episode, but I'll continue to say it. Thank you so much for the support. It's really awesome to see the listenership continue to grow and the numbers of people listening and downloading continue to grow. Really, really appreciate that. Thank you for your support. And thank you for sharing this podcast to coaches who you know would be interested. And speaking of interested, this topic, I'm sure, is one that will interest you because as coaches, we're always looking at different ways to go about coaching this game, different little schemes and different plans and different things that maybe we can pick up on. Some we might take parts of and some we might want to take the whole thing out of. And so today we're going to get some X's and O's talk and specifically talk about offense and specifically our guests hybrid swing offense. And we'll get into philosophically what led to running that as well as implementing it and some points of refinement and just kind of learn about it. And I'm interested in learning about it as well. Uh, my guest today to discuss this topic is the boys basketball coach at Grays Lake Central High School, Illinois. Very happy to be joined by Coach Brian Centella. Coach, thank you so much for joining us today. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. I'm, I'm excited to talk some hoops. Absolutely. And as we said off air, I'm always excited to talk to anybody from my native state of Illinois. So happy that you're here to join us. Coach, Thanks let's go ahead and get me. started with uh, your journey where is the game of basketball taking you where's your coaching journey taking you and what were the steps that led you to uh Grays Lake I think I think that was a lot like you know a, a lot of other kids where I fell in love with sports at, at a really young age and around second or third grade that that love you know turned to basketball pretty quick I, I grew up playing playing every sport played football and basketball all, all the way through high school um, along the way, I, I had some great teammates, some really good coaches. Um, I had an older brother that I looked up to, a younger sister that I looked up to in, in athletics, and two parents that really encouraged me to, to do my best in whatever I was in. Uh, after high school, I was fortunate enough to play basketball uh, for four years at Loris College in Dubuque, Iowa. I had a really good experience there. I was fortunate enough to be a part of some really good teams. Um, that really influenced me as a basketball player I'm from a, t a family of a lot of teachers. So I always knew that I wanted to, to teach. And then kind of with my love of basketball, I knew at a young age that I always wanted to coach. So um, after I graduated from Loris, I've been teaching PE and health and coaching basketball ever since. Had a couple different stops the last seven years. I've been at uh, my alma mater, Grays Lake Central where I graduated uh, in 2005. This is my seventh year as, as a coach there. And this is, I'll be starting my third year as a head coach. So I, I, I wanna ask, I'm always curious whenever I, I have guests who are in the situation that you're in about coming back to your alma mater. Um, was that an, e an easy transition for you? Was it a, a interesting at all for you to go from you know being somebody who played there and now you're coming back and people that may have been your teachers or now your colleagues yeah. what was that kind of transition from from kind of the student end to all of a sudden you're you're working there yeah for me I think the timing was right so I went away to school um I, I did a I, I took me another semester to graduate I did my student student teaching and, and while I was doing my student teaching I actually did like a grad assistant year my eligibility was up at Loris so, so I coached that that year um, on staff at Loris and then for the next four years I taught somewhere other than Gray's Lake I it was one year uh, up in a school near Milwaukee and then three years at a school in Chicago so there was enough time I felt like had passed since I graduated high school. So when I came back, there certainly was a lot of familiar faces, but it was also a different place. Um, going back to me was special. You know, I had family that, that still lived in the area. My brother actually also teaches at the school. He's a cross country and track coach. So coming back home was, was a lot of fun. You know, obviously 
I had such a great experience growing up in Grays Lake and, and, and yeah. playing sports and, and athletics and all those things. So if I can even pass a little bit of down of that experience that I had to students and players that I have in the future, you know, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. Yeah. No, that, that, that's awesome. And sometimes, like you said, it just comes down to the timing and, and when, when it's the right time to kind of make that move for sure. Uh, now, in addition to being a coach, one of your other job titles, is you're a life fitness teacher, which I think is really cool, personally. Uh, I wanted you to touch on that before we get into our topic about you being a life fitness teacher. And, and how does that sort of translate to your approach with your team in terms of your team being the most fit and healthy that it can be throughout the season and probably throughout you know their whole high school career as well? Yeah, I mean, as a life fitness PE teacher, health and wellness is is really important i think sometimes as coaches we we think about our players like oh they're they're 16 or they're they're 17 you know they shouldn't get tired or i used to play all day and you know we forget that there's a lot going on when you're 16 or 17 outside of basketball you know as coaches we spend so much time thinking about the game but you know a lot of times our 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 players are worried about you know relationships or or social things or their SAT or, you know, college applications. There's so much that goes into being a high school student that, you know, balancing those things with athletics and a lot of people, kids at, at our school are multi-sport athletes, balancing all of those things together, you know, sometimes eating well and sleeping can get put on the back burner. Mm -hmm. So I definitely try to, to talk to my players about the importance of, you know, eating well and, and finding time, putting away the phone, turning the TV off, you know, shutting their mind off, getting sleep, uh, taking care of their bodies. You know, strength conditioning is something that I've really tried to improve at in the basketball program in, in the three years that, that I've been the head coach. So it's definitely important to me. It's definitely important to I, I hope my players know it's important. And, and it's something that I try to talk about a lot. It's an area that I think I need to get better at as well, though. Yeah, it's it's one of those really interesting things, like you said, where, you know, kind of in the spot of like, oh, when I was 16 or 17, I'd play forever. I never got tired. I just did this, that or the other. But I even thinking back to when I was that age, I, I remember all the other things that occupied my time and occupied, you know, everything else. And I probably wasn't <laughs> committed as much to my own wellness. Like you talked about coming to sleep and all these other things. And I, and I think that it's really important and you kind of touched on it to remember that you know, there's a lot that is going on in these people's lives, even if they aren't necessarily having the same responsibilities that we do. Uh, I remember uh, somebody once told me, you know, 16 year olds have, you know, 16 year old problems and to them, like those are the most challenging problems they've ever had in their life. And so, you know, just trying to keep that perspective. And, and I think that that's, that's definitely a good approach that you have. And sometimes it's easier said than done, I know, but uh, we do the best we can. For sure. Absolutely. Coach, let's get into some offense now. Uh, this, this hybrid swing offense that, that you like to run. Let, let's start from a uh, more of a philosophical standpoint. What led you to come to the conclusion that this is like the offense that you wanted? Was there some trial and error? Was it something you always liked doing? What kind of led to uh, this decision that you made to run this sort of offense? Yeah, it it, it, it has been kind of a journey to, to get to where I'm um, I really, in year three, feel comfortable with how we how I want us to play. Um, it, it started. We re, we implemented the swing at Loris my sophomore year. It really just boiled down to when I was there. We had a really good personnel to run that offense. We had really versatile big guys that could step out and shoot threes, and we had bigger guards that could post up. And, and in the swing, you kind of touch all the spots. So, you know, whether you're the point guard, shooting guard, three, four, five, doesn't matter. You're, you're going to hit the, the post spot. Um, so, so having guards that can post and having bigs that can step out and, and are comfortable uh, is important. And we were really successful, especially my sophomore and junior year. I think those two years, I think we were 28 and four in our conference. We, you know, we won the conference tournament both years, played in the NCAA tournament, were really efficient offensively. And for me as a player, what was most fun about that system, and there were certainly some things that I didn't like playing in that system, but one of the things that was most fun was you really have to share the ball. 
you know, when we were really good at Loris, we had five guys that averaged double, double digits, double figures. And, yeah. you know, when, how, how do you scout that? We had, you know, I think our leading scorer my sophomore year when we went 15 and won the conference averaged 13 points a game. That's it, you know, and, and we had two more that averaged 12 and two more that averaged 10. And, and, and that's just hard to guard. It, it sure. also, I'm a big believer that in basketball, you know, touching the ball on offense gets you in a rhythm. It gets you invested in the game. Um, it keeps you engaged defensively. It's really hard if you don't get to touch it, and then all of a sudden the ball gets kicked to you and you knock down a three. Those those type of players are are rare. Uh, so I, I feel like getting people touches on the ball is, is is a really good way to play. So then you know I started my coaching journey, and then I, I came back to Gray's Lake, and we were running motion, and, and we did some things well, and we struggled in in some different areas. And then the head coach at the time. We were in his office just kind of chatting, talking about basketball in the offseason. He's like, I'm really thinking about making a change offensively. Mm-hmm. And, and he's like, I'm thinking about looking into something that's a little bit more of a continuity offense. And I'm like, like what? And he's like, you know, like, like the Wisconsin swing. And so I said, Coach, I, I ran that offense for three <laughs> years in college. I, I really, really know it well. Um, if, you know, if, if that's – think about it. We can talk it through. So we talked it through and, and, and then ultimately we decided to, to run with it. And he kind of gave me the reins and let me implement it program wide. And, you know, that was five or six years ago. And it's been a learning process ever since. I thought I, we struggled at times because things that I, I took for granted with college players, you know, high school guys just don't, ha- you know, they don't have the basketball savvy to be able to to deal with some of the things that defenses will try to do to take it away. The, the, some of the reads in the offense just aren't as natural for, for a high school player. Um, it can get a little stagnant at times. So I've really had to, to change it in a lot of ways and tweak it. We certainly use, the, the, still use kind of the base continuity as, as like the structure, but then I, I would guess if there'd be times if you watched us play, you wouldn't even know that we were in traditional sport yeah, yeah. because we're, we're setting ball screens and we're doing, we're doing a ton of other stuff. And it's, it's taken a while to get there. Um, we're, we're certainly not there yet, but um, that's kind of how I came to, to running it. When I took over, I really thought long and hard, do I want to continue this offense? Do I want to try to and do something else? And um, ultimately, we've stuck with it. And, and I think it's going to be really good for us. Something that I think is, is really interesting is that you are a player who, who's been in that system uh, on the playing end of it. And now you're kind of stepped away and now you're on the, the coaching side of it. it. Has it been, was that a transition for you to have to step away from being one who was part of that and had to play it? And now you're kind of observing and you're watching it take place and you're watching it take place at the high school level and not the collegiate level. Uh, obviously, there, there's a lot of advantages for, from being a player who was actually running that system and playing it on the court. But was that a, a difficult transition to have to kind of step away and just sort of watch your players run it without you being able to kind of like jump in there and just wanting to like kind of like do everything? Yeah, definitely. You know, and I think one of the one of the learning curves that I had mm-hmm. right away was that you, you, I had to we have to take it kind of step by step. You can't I, you can't get too far. You can't get two, three, four reads or counters ahead before they've mastered kind of just the basics of it um so yeah it, it definitely was it definitely was challenging in especially going from running it at the the college level to then transition to to the high school level um so again it, it's definitely been a learning curve I'm sure we're going to talk about some things that that I've tweaked and adjusted and to to try to make it fit, you know, spacing has changed a, a little bit. Um, things that I emphasize in the offense have changed a little bit. Definitely preparing, kind of having set entries and set counters that that number one we can be called from me or the players um, ahead of time. 
it was important. You know, I think sometimes I, I thought like, hey, you're being denied. It's it's pretty simple. Back cut or screen <laughs> away or, or 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 receive a flare screen. And, and then I realized I was giving them six or seven different options and they didn't they didn't grasp any of them. So I kind of had to slow some things down. And um, yeah, we're it's a working progress. We're getting we're getting there. So as, as you just mentioned, you know, you mentioned earlier as well that if somebody were to think of like the, the swing offense, they might have a different vision of it, especially if they're thinking of something that was run at like Wisconsin or at the collegiate level versus the way that you have to potentially implement it or teach it. So with that in mind, if somebody were to watch your offense in action and they were watching you on the court, what, what would be some of the actions or some of the reads that they would see as you're running that offense and in in what ways is it kind of unique to you because like you said you kind of had to tweak it and you kind of had to make it work for the players that you had so what would a coach or somebody who's watching see in terms of the types of actions you're looking to get out of that offense yeah, no, for sure. So at the college level, you know, like Wisconsin, Bo Ryan, and and, and now Coach Guard, who who runs it there and runs their version of it, and, and Bo Ryan invented the offense. Um, at I think when he was at UW Platteville, and and you know the benefit you have there is you can recruit those big versatile guys that can step out like a Frank Kaminsky and, and, and shoot threes. And, and, and so if a team switches you, you know, you can post your seven footer on a guard. Well, you know, at the high school level, if your big guy is six, two and, or six, three or six, four, and, and they switch and now you have a six, one guard on your six, four post that, that may not be obviously <laughs> as big of a, yeah. of a, of a mismatch. So you, you, we definitely did have to have to change some things up. Um, I think, I, we've had some, some pretty good guards and, and we have some good young guards in our program. Uh, so one thing that I do like about the offense is that it's easy to flow into. So we're going to push the ball and transition this year. You know, we're going to have some, some simple kind of like quick hitting entries in transition and really anything we do, whether it's a ball screen or, or screen away, it's really easy to flow back into our four out, one in spacing of the swing and get right into our offense. So, you know, I think if, if you came and you watched us play at some point this year, and obviously we haven't started playing yet. So, you know, I think I, hopefully we can get to this point where, you know, you're going to see us pushing the ball in transition, being aggressive, um, trying to hunt for great shots and then seamlessly flowing into our swing stuff. Um, for us this year, we're going to set a ton of ball screens. So one action in the swing is just if the ball goes from the slot to the wing on the strong side, the post automatically sets a UCLA screen for the guard who just passed the ball to the wing for the point guard. Um, and then, you know, you swing the ball to the five and then he looks to reverse it. And then you set the flex and you're, you're in the offense. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing that we like to do is when we set, when, when the ball goes to the wing and the big comes and sets the UCLA screen, we like to get, have that big guy turn and immediately ball screen the wing. So now we have, you know, our, our, one of our wings coming off a ball screen from our five man with our point guard who, who's, at the block, but now he's spacing behind and he's like going to lift up or shake or, you know, coaches call it different things. We kind of just say lift. He's going to lift as that ball screen's going away from him. And, and, and now the five man who just defended a UCLA screen is going to have to get out and hedge or switch or whatever they're going to do to a ball screen. And if the point guards man sags off, the wing can throw it back. And he can shoot it or he can dump it right into the post. We like to get some, some flare screen stuff or, or cut interchange stuff on the weak side to occupy the help. So you'd see a ton of wing ball screen, um, roll, lift, action in our offense. Uh, you'd also hopefully see the ball hit the post quite a bit. And whether sure. it's a, yeah. a guard or, or a big, uh, we definitely want to get low, deep, post up position and, and feed the ball in there and get to the free throw line and, and make layups. So um, those are some of the things that, that you'd see. And then hopefully you'd see some, some good off ball action as well on the weak side. 
it's, it's funny you mentioned earlier about how there are certain things that you know don't don't come natural or there you know some reads or some looks or, or some just actions just aren't as natural um at, at the high school level so when you just mentioned the idea of just just getting post touches and just even the the act of posting up to me at least i've found is something that i had to spend a lot more time than i normally thought i would because even that is something that does not come uh instinctually at least to girls i don't know if it's any different in your experience but i know that's something i always had to explicitly teach was just getting good position and posting up which i know is real key like you said getting those post touches in it, your it offense is, it is so so getting position and posting up is really challenging mm -hmm. and then the other thing that i've found to be incredibly challenging at the high school level is post entry passes players yes. just struggle <laughs> to, to enter the ball in the post or, you know, typically, especially if you're trying to get a, a low, deep seal in the post, it's only going to be there for a second or two before the guy works around back over, the defender works over the top or the help comes or, you know, all those different things. And so, you know, oftentimes I'll find myself on the bench, look in, and then the guy will, will look in two seconds later and throw it and the pass gets tipped and it's too late. And so, yeah. you know, post entry passes and getting good low position is difficult. One thing that we try to do is we try to break down our guards and bigs um almost every day in practice and, and we work a lot we try to work our guards on, on entering the ball on the post and our bigs and, and our bigs and our guards just working on that low low good post position that that you're talking about yeah and it and it's something that i i know can seem so simple but if you're trying to you know, have this offense run effectively, you wouldn't want to have all these other maybe more complex actions be able to run successfully and then it all falls apart on a post-entry pass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. you, uh, as again, as we talked about, uh, implementing this, there are going to be certain challenges and certain things that need to be adjusted in order to meet the skill level and just the amount of time that you have uh, with, with high school players. So when you were putting in this system, can you explain the steps that kind of went into implementing it and teaching players kind of the pieces and the roles and what's expected of them? How do you kind of layer it to uh, where they got comfortable as comfortable as they could with running the offense? What were the steps involved with that? Yeah, so we definitely num you have to have you have to have really good lower level coaches. You yeah. know, the the, the, the nice thing about this offense is it's a program offense. You know, we, we run it at a freshman level, sophomore level, varsity level. We'll, we'll even, you know, try to run a little bit of it in our, in our feeder system. Um, but, you know, so it, it really starts at the freshman level. The, the one thing that it can be a, a difficult balance is that, balancing player development with offensive execution and, and practice. So mm. I'm a big believer that no matter what offense you're going to run, if you have good players, they're going to make you look pretty good. Um, so so program-wide, I'm trying to have a, a, a really big emphasis on skill development. So can our guys handle the ball? Can they shoot? Um, you know, are they good decision makers, you know, talking about whether it's freshman, sophomore, varsity, talking about how we want to play, sharing the ball, you know, being unselfish, hunting for, you know, like I like to say a team shot, like let's get the best team shot every single time down. I think when guys come down and think, you know, how, how can I not, how can I get my shot? How can we get a team mm. shot? How can we get a great shot for us? You know, that's a really fun, fun way to play. Again, it doesn't mean that we have to slow it down and, and run a minute offensive possession. We can play <laughs> fast and still do those things. Yeah. But so emphasizing it program wide, kind of structuring what's important, layering it. So, you know, what they learn as freshmen, they can continue at the sophomore level and then they can add a few more entries or counters or or reads or calls at the sophomore level and then when they get to me you know they they really know the base offensive system so that way I can then tweak it 
you know, and, and add sets that fit our personnel each year because it's going to be different at the high school level. There'll be times where we have a big, there'll be times where we don't, there'll be times where we have our best players, a point guard, there's a, will be times our best players, a wing. So, you know, we really have to kind of adapt the offense while keeping the structure to fit um, personnel at the varsity level. And it's, it's been a fun challenge. Like I said, I, I'm fortunate. I have really good lower level coaches that are, that are bought in. And, um, you know, there's some, there's some high school programs in, in the state right now that run the swing a little differently than, than we do, uh, but that do a great, great job with it. So yeah, yeah I've certainly try to pick the brain of, of those guys, how they've been successful with the offense at the high school level. Um, uh, coach at Geneva High School, coach at Glenbrook South High School that really, really are successful and do a great job with the offense. So I'm just trying to learn and grow and, and, and work together and fit the personnel. So you, you touching back on that, you talked about kind of like maximizing the personnel and, and who it is that you have. And so in your experience over the past few years, have you gone through that different experience where maybe you had a stronger post player or stronger guard or stronger wing? Have you kind of had that sort of situation and if so like how did that change maybe some of the looks or actions you were looking to get out of the swing yeah so you know I, I'm fortunate that that the the previous head coach really I was the the sophomore coach for a few years and then his last year as head coach I was the varsity assistant and I and I was fortunate even as a sophomore coach you know he really let me kind of have a impact on the offense so you know when our first year or two running it we had a we had a pretty good big who could score and you know a lot of times we gave him the freedom instead of you know if he's in the post and the ball gets swung instead of setting the flex and getting somebody else in the you know he'd just go block to block and, and we'd almost kind of play four out one in and then when he wanted to get out he'd trigger us back into the offense so we kind of played through him and, and then we then we had a, a, a versatile five man kind of undersized, but a really good passer. And, and we kind of played him just all over. And we really used his passing to kind of pick teams apart in decision-making, um, you know, at times. And, and we struggled too with, with this offense. So we're certainly not a juggernaut or anything, we're, <laughs> but, and then uh, my first year as head coach, we, we had a, a really good, pretty skilled, really athletic big man, um, and, and, a, and a good quick point guard that we kind of played through and then shooters all around. So, so we were, we didn't have a ton of guys outside of our point guard that could create off the dribble. So we really ran a lot of set plays. Um, one thing that, that I heard coach painter from Purdue talk about, if you want to get the ball in the post, you better run a set to, to get it there because of what we already talked about. Yeah. Post entry passes post entry, and, yeah. and all that stuff. So we ran a lot of sets to kind of get us into the offense because, you know, we really had to create shots from screening and cutting more so than dribble penetrating. But this year we have a really different team. We have a couple guards that can really put it on the floor that really want to push the pace. So we're going to play through them quite a bit. So, so that's why we're going to some more, you know, picking the pace up transition, really going to emphasize ball screens and, and uh, trying to give our free up our guards a little bit to, to attack the basket and, and drive and kick and get in the paint within the, the structure of our swing. Yeah. And, you know, ki kind of going along with that, you know, just like you talked about, like kind of playing to your strengths. And, you know, I I've seen teams and I've coached teams who, you know, they run a certain type of offense, whether, you know, it's a flex or a swing. But if they have the ability to get out and transition and they have the ability to score before, you know, having to necessarily set up the offense, you know, the, the name of the game is scoring and they'll take that first and then fall back into their offense. And I think that that's just like something interesting to consider is, you know, if you have certain strengths that, you can just kind of play up and down and use those strengths. And then, you know, if you have your offense that you can obviously work in and fall back to if you need need to and, and run it a little bit longer. Exactly. And, and that real, that made me think of, you know, one of the challenges that I've, I've had implementing and running the swing is that 
So when you teach a continuity offense, you typically start by teaching the continuity, like the, the, the movement. And so you spend a lot of time, or at least I did, and it was probably a mistake. Hey, let's go slot to slot. You know, now let's hit the wing and that trick. And so you're just triggering the offense and you're going through and you're repping it for a minute. But what I failed to realize is, you know, you're not necessarily, hey, every screen, every pass, you know, you need to, we're looking to score. We're not just looking to make the <laughs> next pass or make yeah. the next screen. Like, so, so kind of flipping the mindset of, and getting into some of our like more deadly counters quicker is, has been a big adjustment and something that I'm moving to this year. For example, you know, one thing that we're really going to try to do is I, I'm, I'm, I call it like second side actions. And so I, we, we reverse the ball, whether it's like a dribble entry reversal, or just, we go slot to slot that triggers our first flex continuity stuff. And then we come right back to the, the five man who kind of shapes up after the flex. And then on that second side action, we run a read up, which is a counter where instead of coming off the flex, he comes off of like a pin down or we run a follow, which is the five man swings it one more to the, to the wing and he follows it to, for a ball screen. Or we run a smash, which is the guy that just came off the flex stays and, and, and gets an isolation in the post. So like we're trying to get into some of our scoring actions quicker, but still getting at least that one ball reversal to kind of keep the defense honest. So you you brought up something that that I think is is really important to kind of address and kind of discuss and think about when it comes to any sort of offense that has a lot of looks and has a lot of actions to it. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different scoring actions that come out of uh, the swing offense that you just mentioned. We just talked about the different like variations, the, the pin down screens and different screens and different post entry looks and, and ball reversals. And as you mentioned, eventually at some point, the players have to have the decision-making ability to figure out what is working so that they can get the ball into the basket. You know, I, I've been in the same way where I've had players who can, you know, run through all these motions, but nobody's really looking to score. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you about the, the decision-making process of your players finding the right look or finding the right scoring action that's going to lead to the best result possible. I guess there's two parts to this question. How have you kind of coach that in them and, and, and what do your players now kind of like have to look for or do they look for to decide, okay, this is the scoring action we want to get into on this possession? I think my first year, so which was two years ago and then, and then this past year was a, a COVID shortened season for, for uh, most, most high schools, certainly for us. Um, and then this year, that, that was something that I, 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 I probably overcoached a little bit, you know, I, I would try mm -hmm. to dictate the actions so much that we were probably a little bit too robotic. So mm -hmm. kind of later in the season, year one for me, I realized that. And so I started letting them just, I, I, we started doing a drill every day that I just called four on four wide, where it was four on four, nothing special, um, and keep the floor spaced and, and kind of our perimeter swing spacing, just take the post out and just play. So, you, you know, you can ball screen, you can down screen, you can flare screen, you can screen and slip. And, and, and so, and I didn't say a word other than, you know, just encourage them to, to move the ball and be shot ready and be aggressive and, you know, all those things. I didn't dictate what they were getting into. And I, and I quickly noticed that when we started going five on five again, it really translated to better just off ball movement, getting into things that worked without me having to, to dictate it or to call it every single time down. And that's, that's going to be a huge point of emphasis for me this year mm -hmm. because, like I said, we, we have some pretty skilled guards. We have some, you know, a, a skilled wing that can do some things. And I don't want to get in the way slowing them down. They know because we do, we do it every day in practice, the types of actions that work and that are successful. Kind of talked about those wing ball screens. I talked about, you know, getting good post touches, 
talked about kind of playing inside out. So, so knowing, you know, where dribble penetration opportunities will come within the offense and then the spacing that happens after it. And so, you know, hopefully we can get to a point where, you know, I don't need to be, be calling stuff out once we're in the flow of our offense that they're getting to these things, they're on their own. And, and so definitely four on four wide, definitely just playing more, doing another kind of small sided game we call three on three coach release. Those have been huge for me as far as freeing up our, our players to be able to, to make decisions on their own and get into those actions that we're good at without me having to dictate it every time. Well, considering like the experience that that some of your players have had in this system and some of them have been in it and some of them kind of know, even if they've been, you know, only introduced to the the first few steps, you know, as they were younger and then they're building on it year after year, I feel that at a certain point, your players probably understand from being in this system what works best and what opportunities get the best result. So I feel like they might already like have that sort of encyclopedia of knowledge of knowing, hey, when we do this, typically when this certain action happens, we we tend to get the best results as a team. And, and maybe that seems to also be something that y- your players have, have seen and helps them take more responsibility. So like you said, you don't have to necessarily call it out. It, exa- absolutely. That's 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 where we're trying to get to mm-hmm. you know I, I i think as the season you know we play everybody in our conference twice as the season goes along and, and you have more and more games on tape teams scout so well and if you if your players are, are looking over to you when they're in the middle of a possession or to start a <laughs> possession i think that that works for some teams but i think unless you just have really, really, really sound, skilled basketball players, um, you know, teams are going to take you out of that stuff. So, so your guys need to be able to react and respond on their own. Yeah. Yeah. A hundred percent. And, and if your players can just play and instead of having to, to, to look at you, uh, I, I think it just makes them so much more faster too, because they can just get into it and uh, know what needs to get done for sure. Uh, I want to touch on, the uh, the act of ball screening, and I know that that's something that that is incredibly important. You talked a, a lot about the different types of screen action that you're looking to get into. So, any coach that I talk to who uh, has screening as an important part of their offense, I, I like to get their thoughts on just screening in general. What makes a good screen? What makes even a good cutting action? And and I wanted to ask you what what is a successful screen to you, and and what does that look like in your offense when a screen action is done well that's something that that's a really good point because I I feel like so so much of basketball especially you know just AU or summer basketball is 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 so wide open Mm -hmm. that that it's kind of like the best player just has the ball and attacks and drives and kicks and then the next guy either shoots it or drives it which is which is an awesome way to play, but it doesn't involve a ton of screening. So you know we we really try to teach how to screen, and so you know that's that's two feet jump stop. Um, you're you're trying to screen a body, not not an area. Um, you're trying to make contact. The guy that's coming off the screen is trying to come shoulder to shoulder. You know all the things that that we were taught as kids, I I think are still important um, in the game to to getting somebody open. It it can be the difference. You know, a a great screen is not always going to get the guy that you screen open, but if it doesn't and you set a great screen, almost surely you're going to be open. So um, yeah, I, I think just emphasizing it, kind of talking about showing what a good solid screen looks like, you know, sometimes ball screens are a little different because you like we have a four man this year that can really shoot it. So, you know, he'll pop and slip sometimes. Uh, but but as far as just kind of like the foundational UCLA and flex screen and, and, and then like flare screens or down screens in our offense that you'll see. Yeah, we, we try to get body to body screen a man, two foot jump stop, uh, make contact. 
if, if the ref gets you once for 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 an illegal screen, okay, now we know we can we can pull back a little bit. But until he does, we should be we should be the most physical screening team that a team plays all year because we screen a ton in our offense. And and to me, it's it kind of is very similar to the idea of like post entry. Like it, it's not something that I think can be taken for granted or assumed when it comes to coaching. And if you want it done a certain way. Uh, you have to explicitly teach the way that it needs to be done. And like you said, you might, you might end up being a little bit more physical than the, the players are used to when it comes to setting screens. But I always found, and, and I, I think you might agree of something like screening, especially like you can always tone it down a little bit, but uh, you might as well see if it gets called first, like you said. Yes, absolutely. So uh, going back to the idea of like practice and, and refinement, and one of the things that I, I always am interested in getting, getting opinions about when it comes to, you know, working on your offense and, and implementing your offense in, in a practice situation and refining it is doing it in a way that's authentic and, and game-like and also at the same time, potentially also working on, on your defense as well and really simulating the, the, the best of both worlds where you're, you're improvement, making improvement on your offense but also you're not just, you know, letting your defense off the hook and, you know, kind of doing whatever they want to do. So how do you kind of refine um, your swing offense in a way that's kind of like game-like, but also like really authentic and, and works with your uh, improving your defense as well? Yeah, we, I mean, it's something that, that we break it down and, and we do some five on O. I think mm -hmm. for just for, for, for timing, and I, I know it doesn't always translate how you want it to, to a game, but I still think if you, if you run like the, the swing, the base swing is really simple, but to run it well, you really have to have a lot of counters and stuff. So I think just practicing the, the movement patterns, the, the screens, the, the communication, the ball movement, the pace, I still like five on O, you know, and then you got to quickly graduate and, and, and get to some three on three, four on four stuff that I already mentioned, and yep. then try to play a ton. You know, I'm, I'm a big believer that the more kids can just play five on five basketball, the, the better off. I think it's a, if, if, you know, as long as guys play the right way, it's, it's great conditioning, um, you know, there's, there's things that, that you'll see, you kind of mentioned it earlier that the guys have played in the offense. So, you know, like I will learn stuff from, from my guys all the time, you know, they'll get into something that I'm like, Oh man, that flew, that was perfect. I, I love how that looked. <laughs> yeah. Let's make a name for it and, and, and do it again. So, uh, you know, letting them play, you know, one, one other thing that, that I do is, is that's been helpful, you know, team one, one way teams will try to get us out of the offense is, is they'll like deny ball reversals or different things like that. And so, you know, sometimes I'll say, all right, we're going to play five on five half court, no dribble. You know, so you can't, you can't dribble. And, and it's really, it's really ugly and really messy. I got that from coach guard at not uh, Wisconsin, but his brother at UW Platteville. You know, I, I learned that from him. He said he did that. And, and, and I really, I liked it. So I, I tried doing that. And, um, so kind of different restrictions, you know, if, if we want to work on something specific, like, Hey, we, we can't score. Like if it's our, our first group versus you know, maybe our, our, our bottom group, Hey, we can't score until we get a post touch, you know, then, mm -hmm. then play live after the post touch. And we don't tell the defense that, but, but, you know, just to keep them honest, different things like that, that now the, now the area that, I need help with that I struggle with is, you know, we play kind of a really just sound pack line type defense and we try not to make mistakes, uh, you know, gamble for steals. Like we want you to shoot over a contested hand every time. So we get pretty good, you know, going against that. But then when we go play a team that's denying everything or switching everything, I, I found it's hard to simulate that in practice uh, authentically. So, you know, that's an area that I'm really trying to brainstorm and figure out how to get better at. How can I give our guys better looks of defenses, even zone, which we, 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 we don't really run our, our fist or our swing um, 
again zone but like you know simulating a zone like that's something that mm -hmm. that i struggle with and i'm you know trying to kind of research and, and pick pick the brains of coaches that i know that are mentors and the best way to to do that yeah it's it's always interesting to try and like and like you said kind of like simulate something that you might not necessarily run because then you're at, at a situation where you're almost like trying to teach your you know your defense how to to do this certain action but it's nothing you would normally run it's like i don't want to waste all my time to do that <laughs> you know i'd rather focus on what we normally do and and work on it that way so no i i, I agree with you i think that any any tips or, or any suggestions that even people listening have feel free to comment those about you know successfully replicating and, and working on the different defenses that you might see to try and challenge uh what your offense is doing i, I think would be super helpful for sure um Speaking of, you, you talked a little bit about things that um, are done to try and like keep you out of your rhythm. I know one of the, the worries that a lot of people have um, with the, the swing offense is kind of the repetitive nature that it can, can get into and how it can become kind of predictable. And so therefore players um, need to have, you know, counters ready. Coaches need to be able to go through those counters. Uh, I know we touched on it a little bit, but I kind of wanted to ask specifically about ways or maybe in your experience what have you seen in terms of how the swing offense can get stagnant or repetitive are there certain motions or certain actions that players will kind of naturally fall into consistently doing or consistently looking for and what should maybe coaches be aware of if they're looking to implement the swing offense in terms of hey these are situations where your players might find themselves getting in a rut or getting them or getting just super repetitive have you seen situations like that yeah for sure that's 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 kind of the that's the most challenging part about mm -hmm. running the swing is is when and and i think even like the younger it's implemented in on one hand it's a great offense for like for like youth middle school level but on the other hand i think it it can be a little restrictive like it's cool because every player in the offense will touch every spot on the floor it's good to get your 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 you know your middle school center away from the basket and give him you know decision making responsibility at the three point line because he might not end up being 7 feet he's probably going to be 63 and eventually needs to to learn how to be a guard anyway yeah. so so like that part of it i really like but then you're absolutely right. It can get stagnant. It can get repetitive. Um, so, so, you know, as I've done this for seven years, kind of running it at the high school level and tweaking it and doing things. And, and certainly, like I said, there's, there's guys, you know, even there's the guys that run it better than me, that's for sure. But one thing that I found to be successful is give them, you know, almost as you, you introduce it and, and teach it, give them one of those counters right away. Like, like one of our bread and butters is what we call Utah. So, mm. and that's the thing that I already explained to you. It's the wing entry, UCLA, go right into that ball screen, you know? So, so right off the bat, they know one of our counters, you know, we, we do run a lot of different entries into the offense. Um, so right away, give, give them an entry to, to run. Um, give, give them, give them one of those counters and, and, and then give them the freedom to, to break out of the structure of, of like swing. I watched UW Platteville, which is a division three, really good division three school in, in Wisconsin, uh, where Bo Ryan actually coached and won some national championship. They still run the, a version of the swing there, and, mm -hmm. and I watch them play, and and it's almost it's it's almost doesn't even look like the swing at times because they're so free flowing. So I think when you teach it, don't over teach it. Let your kids still be basketball players. You know, ultimately at the end of the day, that you need to score more points than the other team. So so I think we can kind of overthink it. Um, and, and that's just, it's trial and error. You know, I, I think it's a great program offense. I think you can tweak it to your personnel every year. You know, I think the, the stereotype with the swing is, Hey, it's slow or, um, it, it can get a little bit too repetitive. Um, but I think, I think a lot of teams that run it 
have evolved past that, you know, sure. pretty much any, anybody that runs the swing, whether it's the, uh, the college level or high school level, at least in, in my state, and then co collegiately anywhere, I try to, to try to watch and gobble up as much as I can. Like there's a guy that's at Idaho state right now, who was at, who was, was in the division two national championship game a couple of years ago as a head coach and, and they run it. And a lot of the wing ball screen stuff where the ball gets reversed and then the big man goes right to the wing and follows it for a ball screen. And the guy coming off the flex replaces underneath the ball screen as the bigs roll. I mean, that is really hard to guard. Mm -hmm. And I just, I saw, I saw that guy do it. And he, I think he was like a, a manager for Bo Ryan at Wisconsin and he's been <laughs> super successful head coach, you know? Yeah. And so it, it almost looks like modern five out, you know, basketball that everybody's running, but, but it still, it still has that four out one in spacing. It, it's still attacking the basket with those flex cuts and, but then also giving your guys a lot of freedom. I know that was a long-winded, long-winded well, response. Well, it, it, I mean, it's a really interesting point because, like, at, at its core, it, it, it could be like, a, right? The, the, the swing could be very robotic. It could be very like procedural, depending on the amount of actions you have. But as, as you kind of talked about, there's a lot of counters and there's like a lot of nuances and there's a lot of things that you can change up with it that it can become, you know, uniquely yours or like we talked about uniquely play to your strengths. And I think that for coaches who are kind of like interested in, in implementing something like the swing, like I'm imagining I could go to, you know, a, a website and see it run one way. And then I, I'd go to like a YouTube video and, and see maybe the same principles, but then also see these little differences. And then I can go somewhere else. And before you know it, I'm seeing all these different variations and, something that seems like it's very almost like um I don't want to say cookie cutter but very procedural all of a sudden has so many different ways you can do it that it's it can break up the the monotony of it if, if that makes any sense it, it it really does make sense you know and I, I think like the best way to really learn it or or learn any offense and I probably spend too much time doing this is is finding teams that run it and watch them play games you know i think mm -hmm. i think some of like the breakdown stuff the that you know the a guy talking like me about the offense is you know is good it, it really it really is but i think like if you came and watched us play or if you I mean, and, and you'd rather watch like platteville or U, uw madison or someone you know run, run <laughs> their stuff but you know, you can learn so much and, and it doesn't, it, it ends up not looking like what that, that, that little design on the paper is um, because they, those, those coaches are great and they let their kids make plays and, 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 and make reads. And as you even mentioned earlier, you, yours looks a little bit different just in the last few years that you've done it based on the personnel that you have and based on who your strongest player is. So even you and your in your situation over the past few years has already, you know, had different variations and different wrinkles that one year wouldn't necessarily look the same as the year before it. Absolutely. And you know what, when, if you're up eight with a minute left or, or, or two minutes left, Hey, it's a great, you can just go vanilla swing and you can just grind them <laughs> out. Yeah. And if they can hit all of the, all of the, the basic reads and all of the basic things you need to, you're, you're doing exactly what you need to on the offensive end. And it's no pressure on them because it's something that they can probably run in their sleep. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's, and, and it can, yeah, exactly. It gets the ball moving and uh, kill yeah. some clock if you need yeah, to. There's, there's no, uh, it's like, Oh, what are we doing? No, just run this. Perfect. It's, it's absolutely what we need to get out, out of this possession. No, that's, that's a good, great point. Uh, real quick, before we hit our concluding segment, I did want to touch on something a, a little bit more that you brought up about the different ways that uh, other teams try and stop your offense. You did mention this and about how, you know, the swing is something that a lot of coaches have seen. You mentioned how, you know, there's going to be film on you, especially for the teams that you're playing twice in a year. So in that little chess match of, okay, I know this coach knows what I'm going to do and they're going to try and do this on me. So now I got to counter with this. Uh, what do the other teams, what do they look to try and deny from you? Um, typically, and what do you have to work in as your counters in your swing to sort of work around that? There's, there's, there's like three things that I, I think if I was going to play against a, a team that 
well, I, I'm probably not brave enough to do it. I would just stick to our, you know, our, our base <laughs> defense, but, but, you know, if I was, if I was a little, if I had a little bit more courage, there, there's basically three, three ways that I would, I would try to, to, to defend the swing and that teams have had some success doing it against us is number one, teams will try to switch everything and and if you just run the kind of vanilla version of swing and and they switch if you don't have like a glaring mismatch inside or you you know you don't or or you don't know how to kind of like space away from your guard who has a big slow kit on them on a switch then you the, you can really struggle mm-hmm. um, again because they're going to switch the flex, they're going to switch the UCLA, they're going to stay home, they're going to switch the interchange on the weak side, and and, and then all of a sudden your your kind your guys are kind of scratching their head and 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 retreat dribbling and and going the wrong way. So you know that's one way. Um, so that's something that we work on a lot. You, you like having counters um, in place for when teams do switch. Um, kind of little like almost like little set set play calls for when teams switch and then also just you know punishing mismatches and, and you have to you, you got to be you because teams that what I've found is that if a team switches and that's their primary defense that's a whole different story than when a team is like hey we're going to play Grizzlies like central they run the swing let's just switch all the uclas or let's just switch all the flex screens or let's just switch that and if, if they don't switch all the time they're going to have breakdowns because it's hard to teach with two practices before you play us to just all of a sudden change your defense and switch everything sure. so but that being said you know it, it's something that we have to address you know we we do have little like you know, mismatch plays that we can in the post this year with some really talented guards. We'll definitely have some mismatch plays where uh, we can attack a big who switched on a guard with dribble penetration. So there's definitely things that, you know, that we'll try to do to, to counter their switching. And sometimes the best thing is, hey, if they're switching, run your offense, be aggressive. And when you shoot, don't, 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 the, sometimes the mistake that we'll make is, oh, our center has a guard on him. We have to force feed the ball in the post. And then all of a sudden we turn it over trying to force feed in the post because they're they're loaded up on the on the helpline. Well, what I found can be more successful is move the ball. Let's get a good shot. And now somehow their point guard has to box out our center and we'll just kill yeah. them on the glass. Um, the other thing that that teams will try to do is is I talked about they'll try to lock the ball up on a side. So they'll 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 just try to keep it on the wing or they'll keep it, keep us on a side. We kind of bring the ball down in the slot, like lane line extended up. Um, and then, you know, they, they won't let us reverse the ball. Uh, that can be, that can be a challenge because we do have a post occupying the, the ball side block. So if it's, it can get a little crowded over there. So if they're really pushing you to the sideline and you, then your guard tries to dribble penetrate, he might, unless you really work on those like dribble penetrate reaction stuff with your five man, he's going to run right into them and, and you're not going to have anything. So like we have a couple different ways that we can reverse the ball uh, when teams are denying the slot, you know, sometimes it's simple as, hey, guys, like make a good read. Like if you're being denied, what should you do? Back door, right? Hard back door. The, the, then the wing, the, the slot fills to the wing and, and the, the weak side slot fills to the wing and then the weak side wing fills to the slot. Let's get the ball moving. But other times, you know, we'll have a we'll have a counter, a call in to, to kind of get a make sure we, we get a ball reversal so we can get to some of those second side yeah, actions that sure. I talked about. Yeah, and and I, I think it's really important to just just kind of reverse engineering what we just kind of talked about to kind of put a bow on it for for anything that that you run any sort of offense just to know like okay what is somebody going to do to try and stop this because if you if you don't have that answer prepared uh, somebody else is going to have that answer and if you don't want to caught be caught looking uh, foolish because you didn't even think about that and it sounds like you definitely considered it and and just gives. I think any coach an advantage when they're aware of like what other teams are going to do rather than, you know, being caught off guard by it, you know, and having to adjust on the fly for sure. So yep. uh, to wrap up coach, there's a couple questions that I ask every guest. So I'm going to go ahead and start with this first one here, thinking back on your coaching career, 
uh, whether it's related to uh, your, particularly the, the swing or anything within your coaching career. Uh, what is a moment from your coaching career that you think others listening would be able to learn from? I think some of the stuff that I, I touched on, like the growth and, and not being able to be able to, to, to change the way like we had, we've attacked teaching the offense mm -hmm. um, and, and, and moving away from, you know, kind of the traditional swing stuff when personnel dictates, I think is, is, is definitely a, a lesson, but, but also my first year, we started, we had a pretty good team. I was the, the seniors, I was their sophomore coach. Then I was varsity assistant coach. And then I took over their senior year. So it was a group that I was really close with, but we just had a really, really challenging schedule to start the season, just a loaded Thanksgiving tournament that we probably shouldn't have been in. <laughs> we started the year 0 and 5. And this is, so this is my first year as head varsity coach, you know, the, the and, and we start 0 and 5. And, you can't help but to to kind of just feel down and panic and and all those things and you know I just kind of like reality just hit me and I was just like Brian just just go have a great practice you know like you you know the caliber of opponent we've lost to we lost to a really good team in overtime we lost to another really good team by four like we were playing good schools yeah. to really close games. So we had a lot to be proud of, just the, the ego, the record, you know, from me, from the players, they're just, it just didn't sit well. And, and we, we stayed the course, you know, I didn't, I didn't panic and change everything. You know, I just was like, Hey, well, like what tweaks do we have to make? How do I have a great practice? We're doing a lot of things well. So let's, let's stick with it. The schedule is going to balance out. We'll get rolling. And I think at one point we won like, you know, 11 of our next 13 games and we finished four games above 500. We were like 18 and 14. So we had a solid year. We were, we were a free throw box out away from being conference champions. We had, we had a really good year, but you know, that was definitely a lesson for me as a coach, just first year, zero and five, you know, stepping on the floor in that first home, that, that home game, you know, with that record and just kind of like, puffing out your chest and believing in what we're doing and, and, and giving confidence to our players and, and sticking with the process. And then, you know, ultimately having a really good year after, after a tough start. I, I like the way that you, you kind of talked about, you know, just, let's just have a great practice, you know, <laughs> and just, yeah. just break it down that way, you know, and especially as you said, you know, if you have all of these difficult, you know, games that maybe you had at the beginning or like you even joked about maybe teams you shouldn't have been playing. It's like, find success you know even if you're 0 and 5 I mean there was definitely things that you you did well there but you know it's like we can win this practice kind of and you know we can we can start from there and then and kind of go from there and and I think that that's a great lesson I appreciate you sharing that because I know uh sometimes those slow starts can make you want to blow up everything I know I oh man <laughs> uh, yeah I was, I was questioning everything yeah uh, for sure that's great uh not that you're questioning everything is great but I'm glad that you you didn't do it and yeah uh, stuck the course for sure awesome uh to wrap up coach I give uh every go guess what I call a 60 second soapbox uh your platform to get out your final thought closing message a final idea something you just want to leave the listeners with whether it's related to your swing or anything about coaching in general. So I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor. And if you go longer than 60 seconds, I won't stop you. So coach, go ahead and take it away from there. Well, first of all, thank, thanks for having me on. This was, this was a blast. I, I had so much fun. You know, I'd like, I'd love to connect with, with any coaches out there and talk offense. And, you know, I, I find myself watching way too much film and Twitter stuff and, um, one, you know, as far as a soapbox thing, I don't, I don't have anything, but I wanted to ask you something. There's so many different basketball resources and, and you speak to coaches all the time because you, know, you have a podcast. How do you filter all that information to truly find what, like what works for you and, and, and what have you seen successful coaches kind of, how are they able to filter? Cause you see a set, you want to put it in, or you see something, you want to do it, you how, how do you kind of filter through all that and, and, and stay true to who you are or decide kind of who you are as a coach? I think from, from my experience and from all of the coaches I've talked to, uh, everything has come down to them knowing their players uh, uh, extremely well and knowing exactly what they're capable of, what their strengths are and, 
in what they can do and in, in tailoring everything around what their players are capable of doing. And, and I've talked to coaches who have said, yeah, this set looks great. There's no way my players would be able to effectively run it the way that I would want that to be run. Or, oh, this is great because I have a, you know, a point guard who can, you know, get out in transition and, you know, do a dribble drive and finish, finish in, in transition or whatever the case may be. So in, in my experience, it's, it's players who, who know their, or coaches, excuse me, who, who just know their players really well and can identify whether or not something can work for that group. And I also think kind of going along with what we did, what you and I talked about is, you know, coaches will take something and be like, mm, I like this. I can't run it with this particular group, but I'll file this away in case, you know, I have a situation where I have this sort of personnel. Oh, I do have this sort of personnel. Okay, let me go reach in the file cabinet, pull this out and see if, if that's something that I want to do. So I, I think for me and for the coaches I've talked to, it's if they, if they hear something, they think about their team immediately. Would it work for my current unit? Yes or no. If it wouldn't, would it ever possibly work with a unit that I might have down the line? Yes or no. And then like, is that even something that goes with my coaching philosophy, whatever that may be, and kind of going through that checklist. Um, That's I don't know great, if that was helpful as an answer. That, that, but <laughs> You know, that, that was that was really helpful because I was thinking about it. You, you, you have so many different guests on that, you know, that, that talk about so many different things and and it's like that's a lot to to decide to kind of filter through and 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 really decide how you want to run run things. So that was a great answer. I, yeah, I appreciate and, it, and coach. For, and then for me, uh, just speaking on a on a personal note, and other coaches that I've talked to, you know, I, I've talked to guests who are have really really awesome, um, you know, half court sets that they run, and, and certain even types of continuity offense, or even flex or swing offense, and. There's teams that I've coached before and I've talked to other coaches and worked with other coaches who have said, you know, if this game gets into a situation when we're playing in the half court for more than, you know, a few minutes, we're in trouble. So I, I can sometimes mm -hmm. hear some of these really awesome, really great ideas, and but know about certain teams I've had and said, if I'm ever getting in a situation where, you know, I can think of teams that I've coached where I, I think about the swing offense you go into and I think, man, if we ever get into that situation where we have to run something like this for too long, uh, you, you might as well, we might as well pack it in and, and take the loss yeah. because we just need to get up and down and press and make yeah. the game a track meet sort of thing. So um, even I've had situations talking to people where I think what they run is fantastic and great, but I think to some of the personnel and some of the players I've had, and it's kind of on the, I'll file that away for later because I like it, but I know what my current group sort of needs and I'm going to work with that. Absolutely. Um, yeah. All right, you flipped the script on me. I'm glad I had an answer for you. Yeah, no, I, so, I sorry, I, I didn't mean to. No, you're to good. Like, back on you. I, I didn't have a soapbox thing. You know, I'm, I'm all good. Anyone, yeah. yeah, I'll I'll ask I'll ask you a quick soapbox question before we're done because everyone has opinions on it. Uh, what are your thoughts on the shot clock? I think it's coming. You know, I think it's coming in Illinois. I, I think it'd be it'd be good. You know, I think oh, I hear a lot of. I don't know if coaches, but I hear a lot of people, coaches, whoever talk about it and, and, and they always talk about, you know, their offense. And, and for me, like, I think in, in, you know, we, we run the swing. So people think that's slower. So people may think that, Oh, you don't, you don't want a shot clock. You, <laughs> you want to grind people out. That's not necessarily true. I think we're going to get up and down this year, but for me, more than anything, I'd love it for our defense. We, I think we, if you play like a, we play a really solid sound defense. It's, you know, I think it's so, so important. I'm, I just believe in, in being a, a good solid defensive team so much that, you know, sometimes since we're not gambling, since we're not, like teams can have really long possessions against us and really kind of wear us down. So, and we'll play, we'll play great defense for 45, 50 seconds you know, if we only have to play great defense for, for 30 or 35, I yeah. mean, I think that's, that's going to help our defense even more. And, and, and I'll, and I'll double down on, on our defense if that's the case. So, you know, I think it's coming. I, I think there's a lot of pros to it for a lot of different reasons. You know, the college level plays with the shot clock, the professional level plays with the shot clock, you know um, I, I think it'd be ultimately a good thing. I think people can make excuses or reasons why it shouldn't be. And, and I certainly wouldn't want, you know, going from no shot clock in high school, at least in Illinois to a 24 second shot clock. <laughs> I think that, I think that'd be a huge I get adjustment. Ugly. But, you know, if it was 35 seconds or, or 30, um, you know, let's do it. 
Mm. I'm with you. It's coming. <laughs> yeah, it's coming. Like one yeah, way exactly. or the other, you, you, exactly. you fight it, kickers screaming, but when it, no, when I it think, comes, I think... you're going to be having to coach with it or against it regardless. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. All righty, Coach. Uh, Coach Sintella, I really appreciate you talking about uh, your program, talking about the, the swing, talking about the offense and some of the, you know, trials and tribulations and growth and grows that have come with it. And hopefully you have a, a fully healthy season and able to kind of see everything through and uh, best of luck to you. So thank you so much for joining us, Coach. It was a pleasure. Oh, thanks a lot. I appreciate it. And thank you guys so much for listening. This was another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast, and we will see you guys next. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.